All right. Actually, the blame lies with the creditors and capital flows. Why? Well, you can't have all over borrowing without over lending. We, we tend to forget this one, right? I would love to over borrow. They just won't lend me the money. But back then, because they were pricing in a yield convergence and knew what was going to happen, they were throwing money at these people. So what were they meant to do? They took it, right? The core banks were encouraged to do this because of that uh, repo market regulation of 2001 that said, if you're buying Greece, you're buying Germany. But here's the thing. Here's the spread on Greece. Here's the spread on Germany. Watch me, sorry, reverse versa. Watch me buy Greece, right? I'm going to make more money off this. This is the leverage amplifier that builds up the banking system. This is what leads to the unit labor cost deterioration, right? It's because of the flow of capital. And that's the last purchasing of periphery assets. Here's the evidence for this. This is in 2011, foreign banks combined consolidated claims on Greece, Ireland, Portugal, and Spain, right? 33% of French GDP is basically impaired periphery assets. A third of the size of the economy is junk assets they bought in a moral hazard trade. Same for the Netherlands, same for the Germans. Interesting. Here's another one. Assets held by banks in Germany, France, and the UK in 2012 were double the annual GDP of the entire EU. So if one of those banks fell over and they're interconnected, what do you think is going to happen to the whole system? This is about saving a banking system that's twice the size and twice as levered as the United States. There's the United States for comparison. Its top five banks come to 61% of GDP. There's the, uh, the relationship in the EU. It's two and a half times GDP. So that's why we had austerity policies. It was all about stopping a bank, around, a bank run around the European bond market. But the problem is you can't solve banking problems with budget cuts. You can try, but it doesn't work. Uh, you can't solve liquidity problems with uh, solvency problems with liquidity instruments. And eventually, if you try and run what is de facto a gold standard for a decade, people will get pissed and revolt. And that's what began to happen. If you suppress volatility to that extent, it's going to find a way up and a way out. So consequences of all this, for once, let's not talk about Trump and let's not talk about Brexit. Let's talk about this. Because there's lots of trumpets and they're not just blowing on the right, they're also blowing on the left. If you have a look at Southern Europe, its party systems in Italy and Spain have been completely transformed because of left-wing populism, not because of right-wing populism. If you have a look at Spain, Spain has no right-wing populist party. There's very different shades of this, and it's a global phenomenon from Scotland all the way through to Catalonia, all the way through to Italy. But it's all dying out, right? Because at the start of last year, the guy who looks like a fake James Bond villain <laughs> d didn't actually become the guy who leads the Dutch. And then the Le Pen family business was going out. And even the numbers in Europe were getting bigger. Things were happening. Unemployment's going down. Growth is going up. It's fantastic. You know why? Because in 2015, they stopped squeezing budgets. The automatic stabilizers kicked in, and it started to grow. And that's why Spain's growing, because it's got a 5% deficit. It's that simple. But anyway, let's move along. Unfortunately, it seems that populism's back. That's the German elections. Now, there's a very interesting thing about this. Everyone gets freaked out, quite rightly, about the AFD getting 12.6% of the vote. But if you think about the left side of this, the Greens and the left party, the Linke, add that together, that's more than the AFD. Add the three of them together, and that's more than the SPD gets. Now, there's an opinion poll in FAS, yes, two days ago. The latest opinion polls in the SPD gives them between 17 and 18% of the vote. They're done. The post-war middle parties, the ones that brought us neoliberal compromise, they're reaping the whirlwind of what they have sown. So what's the long-run macro story on how we got here? Forgive me if you've heard this before. I like to think of this in terms of shifts in economic regimes, very much owe, uh, owe a debt to sort of uh, Robert Boyer's work and regulation school thinking on this. When I went to graduate school, that was what the rage was. And then basically we went to varieties of capitalism instead and, and now we've went back because there's much more politics in this, but this is my version of that story. Coming out of the Great Depression, there's one concern right across what we now call the OECD. Don't go back to mass unemployment. Really bad things happen when you do that. So full employment becomes the policy target regardless of how you get there. Supply side, demand side doesn't really matter. These are national economies in the sense that financial flows are extremely restricted. As The Economist magazine put it in 1946, things that you can buy, sell, and drop on your foot, good. Things that speculate, bad. 
cola contracts or corporatism in the in uh, the European theatre, big labour, big capital getting together, inflation control through institutions such as that become the norm, very high taxes and transfers, and I think a really great bit of information, nobody knows who runs the central bank because it's essentially the cheque cashing agency of the Treasury. Jump forward a mere 10 years from the end of that regime in the 1980s and what do you find? Price stability is the number one goal. Inflation is the problem, not unemployment. Globalisation is the name of the game rather than nationally restricted markets. Open financial markets, flexible and globalised labour markets, low taxes and transfers, and everybody knows who runs the central bank because essentially parties have given up trying to govern the economy in any meaningful sense. So evidence for this? Well, if you have a look at US corporate profits and allow a time lag for basically the reset from the high inflation period to a low inflation period, you can kind of see it there. Let's remind ourselves that at this point in time, US corporates have never made as much money as they are making today. Right? The shift against the labor share of income has never been higher, even in the Gilded Age. Next one, US inflation. Now, that's all right pretty well. If you think of the first regime as being labor friendly, you pay for it with productivity improvements up to a point that you can't. When that breaks down, inf investment collapses, you get a kind of Kalekian effect and ultimately you get stagflation. Then you disinflate the system and you build the new one. You see it in there, but here's the best one. Bond yields. Just beautiful. <laughs> Now, here's another one you've probably seen, productivity versus compensation since the 1940s. Look what happens in 1973. Click. There's wage stagnation right there. Now, we know what ended the first regime. It was inflation. Whether it was the internal Kalekian dynamics of the collapse of the full employment economy, whether it was the Triffin dilemma at the heart of Bretton Woods, whether it was the oil shocks, whether it was all of the above concatenated in one nasty package, that was the problem. And essentially, if you're going to try and run capitalism in a world in which if you've got an estimated rate of return of 5% and inflation goes to 7 and you've got negative 2, you're burning money. Your investor class isn't going to put up with that shit. So they didn't. So they refinanced politics. And that was these guys. And we spend a lot of time thinking about the Reagans and the Thatchers and the neoliberal revolution, but we forget about their institutional consequences. That being inflation targeting, central banks, the revolution of macroeconomics that justified it. That was almost, if not more important, because what it allowed was a removal of responsibility for economic outcomes from governments, not just towards markets and individuals, but towards technocracies, which has become incredibly important. Now, when the crisis hit, in the 1970s, we allowed the system to fail, and for better or worse, there was a system reset. That's one way to think about Thatcher, Reagan, neoliberalism, etc. It isn't working, press alt control, delete start again, restart the machine. But this time we didn't. What we did was we bailed the system, and that's the balance sheet of the Fed, and that's the balance sheet of the ECB. So you're essentially not allowing a reset to happen. So you've had wage stagnation, you've had an incredible inequality skew, and you have not allowed the system to reset when it's crashed. In fact, you've doubled down on it. Now, let's ask one question. Where did all that leverage in the system come from? And the red line is the one you want to look at, bank assets to GDP. An incredible rise in the leverage in the system. Well, that was generated by wage stagnation because that leverage had to go somewhere. Here's my favorite little slide from that period. A city bank in 2003 to 2005 had an advertising campaign called Live Richly. Let's think about that for a minute, folks. It's not save up and buy yourself something nice. It's live richly. It's live on credit. I lived in Baltimore in the early 2000s for my sins. And even there, when I went away for a weekend, when I opened up the door and walked through the door, I tripped over the number of credit card offers I was getting, right? This is what Colin Couch calls privatized Keynesianism. We gave up on public sector balance sheet finance and I went to private sector balance sheet finance and on every asset class we could. Now, why were we doing this? Well, because of the gap between wages and profits had become absolutely astronomical. There's euro area consumer credit, it's doubled in real terms, and there's exactly the same thing for the United States prior to the crisis. So you're filling it in. Literally, credit card nation is not a title, it's actually what happened. So what happens when you bail out that massively levered system in 2008? Now, this is the austerity put. Net public debt in the eurozone, oops, don't do that, go back there, that's it. Where's my laser? Net public debt is going down into the crisis. There's an orgy of spending. Bullshit. 
It was going down, right? Notice the timing, 2007 through 2008. What did we do? Oh yeah, we bailed out the global banking system. That's right. And what do you get? A massive rise in debt to GDP. Funny, the same thing happens in the US. I mean, you know, it's a bit like curing a headache with a cat. Got a headache, pick up the cat, rub it cat in your head, put it down, your headache goes away. Obviously the cat cured the headache. This is purely correlative. No, yeah, of course, right? We bailed it out, that's what it was. Now, here's the weird thing. So far, we put, if you include the latest QE figures from Europe into it and, and some other opaque things, there's been about $15 trillion of interventions have gone into the global money supply through the big central banks. And here's the weird thing. Inflation's nowhere. There is no inflation, right? We're talking about normalizing rates. We're talking normalizing to where we should be, which is 2%. Why do you raise interest rates? Because you have pressure from wages. There's no wage pressure. They're not going anywhere. There's, we talk about gains. New York Times every now and again says, wages are rising, like on a three-month basis. They've been stagnant for 30 years. Right? Uh, prices in wholesale goods are going down. Uh, the Eurozone core inflation numbers are still trending downwards rather than upwards. And we've chucked 15 trillion, and 17 trillion by one count, into the global money supply. Now, that's weird because what did Milton tell us? Inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Well, here's a consequence of 2008. We've just run a giant natural experiment on how much money you can chuck into the system to generate inflation, and there's no inflation anywhere. So here's my favorite graph. Da, 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 da. It's in Japanese. Right. Uh, so this is the Japanese cabinet office decided to figure out what, what nominal interest rates were over the very long run. And this is what they figured out. So basically, if you go back to, has anybody watched Game of Thrones? And you watch Game of Thrones? Come on, admit it. The left can have fun too. <laughs> Come on, anyone watch Game of Thrones? Right, okay. So imagine that you're offered a chance to own the, the debt of the Lannisters. You'd probably want a high interest rate because there's a very good chance they'll murder you in your sleep. There's no secondary market to sell this. You can't swap it out for John Smith bonds, right? So when you have sovereign debts around for the first time, guess what? Lots of risk inherent in the bond, no secondary market to put it off, high real interest rates. What happens is you start to integrate these markets around the 15th century and you begin to increase the pool of capital. So when you increase the pool of capital and drop the risk, what has to happen? The price of money goes down, so the interest rate falls. So over the very long run, what you find is nominal interest rates, because there's very little inflation in the system. Six of the big inflationary spikes that we know of happened in the 1970s. Down and down and down. By the time you get to 1815, the Brits are able to finance the Napoleonic Wars on a perpetual paying 3%. By the time you get to 1941, at the day that Pearl Harbor happens, US interest rates are 1.41. We forget how real low interest rates are. Why? Because we sample this bit, the 1970s. We generate all of our ideas from this, and we project that future that must never happen again into our models. And that becomes weird because there's the federal funds rate since 1970. That's not going anywhere. And that predates the GFC. So that's going down. You chuck 15 trillion in and there's still no inflation. That's an interesting world. Now, let's put all this together. You've got a bunch of people who haven't had a wage increase in forever. Their personal balance sheets are bloated. There's no inflation. So there's no inflation to eat their debts as there was in the 1970s. You can't put it on the creditor class. The creditor class runs politics and have never been more powerful, in part because of the inequality skew that this financialization and other processes has generated. There we go. Welcome to global populism. Your debts are too high, your wages are too low to pay off the debt, and the inflation is too low to eat the debt. The left response is to blame capital and globalization, and the right response is to blame immigrants and globalization. That's it. <laughs> now, from there, Let's talk about party politics in the few minutes I've got left. So just read this one. In, in, in a group of 39 European countries, populist parties have improved their share of the vote in national elections to an average of 24.1% in 2017, up from 8.5 in 2000. And this is not just the function of the financial crisis. They have been around a long time. As I mentioned before, anti-system left parties have transformed southern European politics. Right parties have done the same in European north and east. Vote shares and turnouts for centre parties everywhere have all but collapsed. So what's, how does that fit with this regime story? If you think about the first regime, what type of parties environmentally adapted to that? 
one where you have mass parties, one where you have real parties of social integration and mobilisation that are tamed by post-war welfare states and become what Otto Kirchheimer called catch-all parties, whereby the game becomes move to the middle of the distribution, capture the median voter and buy everybody off with public goods. The strategy of pushing out the, public, the possibility frontier of public goods hits the buffers in the 1970 in the inflationary crisis and destroys the redistributionary model based upon taxation and productivity increases, especially for left parties. So right parties never liked this shit. They were quite happy to see it go down, but it caused real problems for basically big left parties. What do you then see? A shift to what various scholars have called the cartel party form. You don't really want to do anything anymore because it gets you into trouble. You've been told by all your economists you shouldn't do anything because you can't do what you think you can do. So what you want to do is push trade out to the WTO. Get your monetary policy and give it to the central banks. Hand it over to the technocrats. Depoliticize it. Reduce the competitive space of party politics and create a cartel that agrees upon where politics should lie and what's beyond the pale for politics. That sounds an awful lot like what happened in the 1990s. That sounds an awful lot about the fragility of things like the Democrats just now, the Labour Party before Corbyn took over, etc. So you're truncating the supply curve of policy, externalising your policy commitments. You're competing more intensely over less. This is perfectly adapted as a forum to the Bernanke Great Moderation world. Because ultimately, governing not very much is fine so long as not very much is wrong. But what happens when your risk optics are wrong? What happens when there's a giant leverage crisis brewing? What happens when you think you understand the system you're part of and you really don't? And then it all suddenly goes wrong and your party systems are unable to respond to it in any meaningful manner. Cartels over the long run, prior to the crisis, invent entryists. The vote share of the centre has been sinking since the 1990s. They've been gaining ground at the same time. The GFC simply accelerated what was there and provided both resources of mobilisation and culturally appropriate frames for people to understand the crisis because the mainstream parties were unable to articulate what was going on, what was wrong and how to fix it. Cartel parties today are what we're left with. This is the Democratic Party today. This is the SPD. They are, in one very real sense, the handmaidens, the constructors of the neoliberal global order. I always remember uh, the quote from uh, Mandelson in Britain who said, I'm perfectly relaxed with people in finance getting disturbingly rich so long as we get to tax them. The problem with that is it's an incredibly a fragile business model because if it blows up, you've got nothing left except the fact that you cost everyone their assets. So they have no interventionist capacity because they didn't think they needed one. They have no alternative to talk of because they were the people who said there was no alternative. They can't go back to fiscal policy because they enshrined monetary dominance. They privatise Keynesianism. They're dependent entirely on elites for funding. And they have no ability to shift their business model. So why aren't we all dead yet? Well, very simple. <laughs> because populism is the system reset. And there's a left-wing one as well as a right-wing one. We always get stuck up in the strum and drang of the right because they're nasty and we don't like their politics. But there's actually an enormous left-wing response as well built into this. The software's been rewritten, the code's been written, written from the ground up. It's just not an institutional forms that we recognize very easily. Second one, I hate to break this to people, but capitalism is anti-fragile. It gains from shocks. I have spent my whole life waiting for the crisis where it ends. It's not like that. It has enormous destructive capacity. It creates human misery on an enormous scale, but it also creates wealth on an enormous scale. And that means it's anti-fragile. It gains from shocks. This will continue. The real threats to the future, climate change, I think passive investment vehicles, happy to talk about that, it's a bit geeky, but nobody talks about it. Compressed term, term premium populism in the Eurozone, they're not a back to the 1930s moment. It's just a false analogy. I'd be happy to explain why. But the real lesson of this, I've got 38 seconds left, I'm timing this brilliantly. The real lesson of 2008 is we know what the system looks like and we know how to bail it and we'll do it again if we need to. And here's the little slide that shows that. Adam's seen this before. This one is brilliant. This is the aggregate stock of government debt held by central banks. Holy you know that the government of Japan, 80% of JGBs issued since 2012 have been bought by their own central bank? Wow. Have a look at the right one. Adam will talk about this as well. The green one is public holdings of public debt. Up and up and up and up. <laughs>
What does this mean? It means that if there's another crisis, stop that. It means if there's another crisis, we have, despite what they say, plenty of ammunition and many ways of bailing out the system once again. Let's say equity markets completely tank over the next two years, which I think is really possible. All you're going to do is have the equivalent of QE for equity markets. You'll just stick a huge amount of liquidity in that and bail the system again and stick it back on the public balance sheet. And we will continue to do this. In a weird way, what you've got is socialism through the central bank. I'll leave you with that.